the water well business, right? And, and eventually he told me like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing this compliance thing, right? Like in addition to punching holes in the ground for people, I'm also handling the regulatory compliance afterwards. And I was like, what, what regulations exist around water wells? Um, very niche, niche deep dive, but basically all the aquifers, like I said, all the groundwater is being depleted too fast. We can't artificially or naturally replenish it. And so the, the government's response has been to dictate how much people are allowed to pump, require that they report on how much they've pumped, penalize them if they exceed their budgets, all this kind of stuff. We need to produce more rain in the interior or, or more snowpack. And so weather modification is the only way out of like the increasing aridification in the West. Like if you don't want Las Vegas, Phoenix, Tucson, LA to be deleted, uh, you need more rain in the American West. Dude, thanks for coming on the pod. Thanks for having me, guys. Good to have you in the office. Yeah, yeah, it's blessed to be back in DFW. Yeah, uh, it's a beautiful day. A lot of clouds, but no rain. Mm -hmm. You're making it rain. Talk about Rainmaker and what you're building. Totally, totally. Um, in short, we are taking technology that was first pioneered in the United States in 1953. Um, very crude means of modifying the weather, increasing the amount of precipitation that we get in either rain or snow, and we're bringing that into the 21st century with an array of different innovations between software, hardware, new chemical agents, new chemistry. Um, we're looking to make it rain for a variety of folks, right? Like we're, we're looking to first provide more rain to farms that are in need in the American West and offset the amount of aridification of our agricultural base that's going on. Then. Eventually, we want to undertake grander projects like terraforming the American West, making it all green, beautifying it, and uh, also bombing hurricanes out of existence and things like that. There you go. So that's the eventual goal. Can you talk to us about the origins of cloud seeding? What was the, how did that discovery happen? And yeah, how did you say somewhere that it existed, but no one, but then we stopped doing it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, do you, did you guys watch, or maybe did you have family that watched Powerpuff Girls? Yes. Okay. I, I did not watch it. Okay. okay yeah, yes, yeah, I watched yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I did too. I did too. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll admit that. Uh, you're familiar with how like the professor makes his sugar spice everything nice, and then also accidentally dumps Agent X into the mm -hmm. vat, right, and then creates the Powerpuff Girls. Um, very similar story in the origins of cloud seeding, right? It was an accident that we figured it out. So this guy Vincent Schaefer was doing some cloud physics research, had a cloud chamber, right, which is basically just this thing that you can um, tune the uh, vapor density. It's a box where you can tune the vapor density, the temperature, that kind of stuff, do all sorts of experiments. And he spilled um, some dry ice and then some silver iodide in on another occasion and realized that the amount of ice crystals in the box that he spilled in was greater after he spilled this mm. you know, exogenous agent into it. And so what he realized was, because it was you know, 1953 and dudes rocked at the time and you could do whatever you wanted, was, okay, I have this little artificial box of a cloud in my lab and I introduced this chemical into it and then I made more ice. Like, I have a plane, I can just fly up over a cloud in the western like New York mountains, mm -hmm. toss some of this out of the back of my plane, and then induce like nucleation of ice and a, and a storm that way. And that's what he did. He literally just flew up in his plane, started hucking dry ice out the back, and then silver iodide eventually induced the first man-made um, snowstorm ever uh, in, in the early 50s. And so he figured it out then. And uh, it was pretty rapidly adopted after that because you know, we had this whole uh, technologically optimistic outlook at the time in the mm -hmm. 50s and 60s. Um, modifying the weather was a big point of conversation, right, for, for a variety of applications. Like, you can just imagine, in the status quo, people think of the weather, right, and like inclement weather in particular as acts of God. Like, insurance policies and contracts have acts of God written. Oh, we right? can't do anything about it. Exactly. Hur hurricanes come into my house. Exactly, but but screw it. No. Yeah, hurricanes come to the house. A storm makes a power outage, something like that. Like a data center goes down, something like this, because of a flood. Um, we view it as though like weather is part of the rules of the game of existence and of society. When back in the fifties and sixties, we actually realized those were, you know, dials that we could adjust, right, and and knobs that we could tune. And so we were trying to do hail suppression. Right? So if you had too much hail, either over a city or over farms, that would do property damage or damage to a crop. 
You could reduce the amount of hail by modifying the chemistry within the cloud. Um, you could do precipitation enhancement, rain enhancement for the sake of immediately over farms giving more irrigation or preferable in some circumstances, producing more snowpack in mountain ranges that would produce reliable snow melt into all of the existing conveyance infrastructure of water. Um, and then in like the most aspirational cases, I think in the late 60s up until the early 80s, we were engaged in something called a Project Storm Fury. And so this is, this is that bombing hurricanes out of existence okay. thing that I alluded to. So not with nukes, not with nukes. There was some recent news about some people talking about using nukes to do that. But um, we, we actually, in the United States, with the US Weather Modification Bureau, in conjunction with the US Air Force and NOAA, um, we would fly these bombers out over the Atlantic, seed them with silver iodide at the time, um, and try to, one, uh, induce precipitation in them uh, so that the amount of momentum and the amount of water that they brought to the coasts when they broke against the coast was lesser. And also, in seeding them, you, you would relute, uh, release the latent heat, you'd expand the eye of the storm, and subsequently slow down the velocity of the winds at the edge, so less damage would be done by that. So, so we did all kinds of things. We were trying to do all kinds of things in the 50s, 60s, 70s with weather modification. Um, and there were a variety of reasons as to, to why it fell off. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's sort of trite at this point to talk about like the technological stagnation narrative, um, but that's part of it, right? Like we just lost the chutzpah to do great things. Um, Dew's no longer rocked, you you could say. Um, another reason was that the uh, means by which we could quantify the results of cloud seeding were were just not yet created, right? Radar. Uh, and satellite imagery of these weather systems was not proliferate, proliferated enough and cheap enough to precisely identify, OK, this band of new rain is clearly anthropogenic. It's clearly man-made. And so subsequently, we can justify continuing this operation at a given cost, because that water we produced yeah. is worth this much value. Um, so, so in addition to us sort of losing our chutzpah, in addition to not having like the right means to quantify the value of weather modification, because we didn't have good enough radar, um, we also had this problem, which was that like we were using Cessnas and, and like bombers to drop single digit, maybe double digit kilograms of this chemical agent into storms. Um, way overkill. Right. We, we didn't have radar, so we couldn't precisely identify where we should even be flying the planes. So just the, the, the unit economics, the business case didn't make sense at all. It was only in these very niche, large scale government applications that, that you can justify weather mod. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that's sort of the background, and it fell off. Um, and then thankfully, uh, some people hadn't forgot about it. Some people at CU Boulder have kind of been tinkering away at this discreetly over the last few decades. But but even more than that, um, some people overseas have done much, much better work than anyone in the United States. So um, most folks, not most, a lot of folks are familiar with like the United Arab Emirates rain enhancement program. Mm -hmm. So they're making it rain in the middle of the desert. Um, funny thing about that is their civil engineers thought there'd never be any rain. So they didn't build the roads with any gradation to them. So they're just, they're totally flat. So they've flooded indefinitely yeah. whenever there's rain. Um, so that's funny. Uh, yeah. And then so Saudi also does some rain enhancement. But more than any of these programs are consequential, China's rain enhancement program and Weather Mod Bureau is uh, gargantuan. So they employ about 30,000 people wow. uh, specifically for weather mod. Um, and there's a couple applications that they disclose they're using it for, right? So for military parades, for the Olympics, um, they'll seed prior to any of these so that there's no raining on parades, literally. Mm -hmm. um, great optics, great choice on their behalf, yeah. by the way. I don't know if wish you can like call in and be like, no rain on my birthday. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah for, exactly that. Yeah. Um, so, so they do that. And then they do uh, precipitation enhancement over the Yangtze River. Mm -hmm. um, so they're trying to supplement their hydroelectric water flows, right? Produce more power that way, more reliably and more sustainably. They're also trying to produce more water just for agriculture, right? Like there's persistent droughts there and throughout the rest of the world. Um, and so obviously one, one thing you could do to alleviate that, if you can do it, is produce more rain. So there's that application. And then, then the biggest, craziest one that I, I talk about as much as I can is the uh, Green Wall of China project. Um, have it, did I talk to you about that already? Uh, no, I don't think so. So um, the Gobi Desert, right? Yeah. They uh, view that as a problem to be solved, meaning like that should all become arable land or forested land or just something green, right? Like right. something better than a desert that's totally uninhabited by any, any organisms. Um, 
And so they started planting all these monoculture trees there, and they realized, like, well, actually, the taproots of these trees are consuming more water than the natural flora can sustain. So actually, we're accelerating the aridification oh. of the desert by planting these trees. But we're not going to stop planting these trees. We're just going to make it rain more. So they're, they're seeding over a few hundred thousand hectares in the Gobi Desert and successfully turning it green. Um, so there, there's, there's people overseas, there's nations overseas doing titanic projects and weather modification, and we're just sleeping on it altogether. It seems like our prob the, uh, has one way in which we've tackled the water problem in the US, especially in the West, is just like it basically imagining the, no the, the level of water is set. We're just going to build aquifers or storage tanks and try to store as much of it as possible. Instead of what you're saying, which is, why don't we just make more water? Why don't we just make it rain more? Mm -hmm. like how, how's, what have we done since the 70s till now to try to solve the drought in, in the West? Yeah, from the 70s till now, like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like we, we, we had this uh, like great boom of spectacular engineering and like unimaginably large, previously unimaginably large infrastructure projects, right? Mm -hmm. Like the California State Water Project is huge, like pumping water from the Sierras all the way down to mm -hmm. San Diego and mm -hmm. everywhere in between. Um, that's a really impressive project. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that like Americans should be proud of, like mankind should be proud of, because we turned this totally arid desert in the Central Valley into like the, the most fertile region in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but that was more from like the 20s to the 60s. Uh, you know, the Hoover Dam, right? right? That was at the early portion of the 20th century. Um, I think like what, 10s through 20s. Mm -hmm. um, what have we done since then? Uh, like the, the Sites Reservoir is this thing we've been kicking around since like the late 70s in Northern California. Like we can't even build one reservoir right. anymore. Um, well, the cost of like a, a quarter mile of uh, railroad track is 6.8 billion in California. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, like yeah, imagine yeah. a reservoir. They're like, no way. Yeah, 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 exactly. Now, now that said, um, we've gotten better at desal. That's been consequential, right? Because we can offset the amount of fresh water that we need from you know, the mountains or from rain with what we can produce from the coast. But the problem with desal is that like, Utah can't desalinate, right? Mm -hmm. And Colorado and New Mexico and probably Arizona even can't desalinate. Um, like it's a great way to offset the amount of water that uh, the coastal communities need, namely just California. And maybe if Utah or if, if Arizona feels like spending billions and billions of dollars on capex and then hundreds of million, millions on maintenance and successfully negotiates an interstate treaty with Mexico yeah. to pump water from the sea, uh, sea of Cortez inland, then maybe they can work that out. Um, but like they probably can't. Um, just because gigascale projects like that are too expensive and, and require too much political capital. Um, and, then, and then worse than that, like, they probably shouldn't because you can either use brackish groundwater desalination. There's these huge aquifers that we've never tapped before mm -hmm. because they're too saline to irrigate with. We can, ir we, can, we can desalinate those in the interior. That's good, but it's not sufficient because like, we'll just run out of those aquifers mm -hmm. again, given current consumption. We need to produce more rain in the interior or, or more snowpack. And so weather modification is the only way out of like, the increasing aridification in the West. Like, if you don't want Las Vegas, Phoenix, Tucson, LA to be deleted, uh, you need more rain in the American West. Las Vegas, I could do without. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No, okay. Uh, but so it's because also these areas, like some of the projects that you mentioned earlier in the beginning of the 20th century, don't account for the insane population growth that these areas have seen, like San Diego and other places, mm -hmm. since the original, you know, infrastructure projects to get water. Yeah, in, that, in it, those spaces. No? It's interesting with your project. I think it's been really exciting for a lot of people who have seen it and read about it, but it's. It, now it's surprising to me that no one has been working on it in the last, you know, in the U.S. all these years. How did you get into it? How did you get on this path? Yeah, sure. So um, nominally the gym um, in a certain sense. Based. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of alpha for anybody listening. There's a lot of alpha in the gym. You should go look. Um, you can become alpha. And there's also more yes, alpha. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Alpha abounds. Yeah. So... <laughs> So I was going to school at Cal. I was studying physics and data science. And um, then I moved to Texas when the pandemic hit. I had some family. 
super lucky um, to have moved here. Great community, great time with family. Um, got baptized here, uh, so like mm -hmm. very grateful to DFW for that. Um, but also because I just wanted to meet people, I became a personal trainer, uh, like on the side on the weekends, and I met a bunch of super capable, super successful people, one of which was the biggest groundwater well driller in Texas. Um, and so his name is Jason. We just became friends, started talking about, um, you know, like the, the, the water well business, right? And, mm -hmm. and eventually he told me like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing this compliance thing, right? Like in addition to punching holes in the ground for people, I'm also handling the regulatory compliance afterwards. And I was like, what, what regulations exist around water wells? Um, very niche, niche deep dive, but basically all the aquifers, like I said, all the groundwater is being depleted too fast. We can't artificially or naturally replenish it. And so the, the government's response has been to dictate how much people are allowed to pump, mm -hmm. require that they report on how much they've pumped, penalize them if they exceed their budgets, all this kind of stuff. And so he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm sending this you know, guy out in a truck, having him read an analog meter on the well and then submit the report because my customers just don't want to deal with it. It's like, well, why don't, instead of running this as a consultancy, you use like some IoT stuff um, and automate it. And so we co-founded a company called TerraSeco that automated the regulatory compliance for groundwater users, right? So farms, HOAs, factories, corporate campuses, anybody that had a groundwater well, we would handle the compliance for. Mm -hmm. So I was working on that for a while and then we started making some money and then uh, I went back to school and we started making some more money and then I dropped out of college because okay. we were making enough. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any interest in this stuff beforehand or you were just Z zero. You're zero. just like, hey, I'm gonna meet people, I'm gonna talk to people and just, just see what's out there. Yeah, I, I didn't know about like tech entrepreneurship. I didn't uh, know about water policy, I didn't know about water infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Um I never thought I would live in Texas prior to, to moving right. down. Um so very grateful to God for opening the doors uh, for me in such a way that, that I got to that point. And so I worked on TerraSeco um, and we scaled it up pretty well uh, between, you know, like uh, late 2021 um, up until early this year in March when I sold my interest in the company. Um, and so I sold my interest in the company for like economic reasons for one, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then also because there's this sort of like nagging desire that I had, which was stem, stemming from the fact that um, TerraSeco, great company, great problem, like making people's lives more convenient is good, or at least like less unduly inconvenient, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and that was good, but these regulations only existed because water was scarce, right? Like the ultimate problem mm -hmm. is that water was scarce. So I looked into all these different technology stacks just out of like interest um, and curiosity to see who was solving the water scarcity problem, and it turned out turns out nobody nobody was right mm -hmm. um like the the dialectic was between desalinating the whole pacific and spending 100 billion dollars to do it and like just being totally malthusian and saying like forget it we hate farmers you get a low flow toilet and like a two minute shower right. and it's as simple as that and yeah. so i i just by doing a bunch of like googling and internet searching stumbled upon weather modification did a ton of reading about it and ended up at this thing called the weather modification association conference um and that was in Boulder, Colorado. Less of the sort of like Bohemian Grove type conference than mm -hmm. like the old academic type conference. Um, got up to speed on like the state of the science, um, realized that my suspicions were correct, that like some important innovation had occurred in the space in the last 70 years, namely like more abundant radar and the mm -hmm. use of set radar for quantifying the yields of cloud seeding. But like, it hadn't been well commercialized and nobody had improved upon the means by which we were doing it. So the yields were still relatively low. Um, and so I, I committed then in April, I, uh, I talked to Michael Gibson on, um, on a zoom call from the conference actually from wow. 1517. Yeah. Um, and I was He's like, Hey, right around the corner. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't far. Yeah, actually. True, time. Yeah. Um, and I was like, Hey, in your book, you talk about cloud seeding, like that's what I'm doing. And he was like, Awesome, how? And so we, we went back and forth a little bit and, and he was our first backer. Um, so super, super grateful to 1517. But um, it, was, it was that series of events that, uh, you know, I, I will take some credit for having facilitated because I talked to some people that were extremely helpful. But ultimately, like, I think it was a lot of people along the way, um, a lot of people in the scientific community uh, and, and also God that, that, like, led my steps towards this endeavor. Yeah. So why make the jump from 
uh, learning about the pro the problem, learning about the tech, to this is what I will do. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, a lot of people, there's you know, guys in general are naturally curious. You, see, you go autistic on a topic. You're like, I'm gonna become the best at, you know. Yeah. Um, but what makes you go from that to, I will build the solution here. Um. So t two thoughts, right? Like one, um, I think that. Uh, I think that there may be vocations in life that people are better suited for, right? Um, I think that you can read into the course of your life a narrative that makes sense. Um, and everything that had happened prior to this between learning about water policy, water infrastructure, being the only guy I knew that was talking about weather modification like obsessively. Like I remember I, I took this coffee meeting with a much more successful founder than I in LA. And I was like, isn't this idea crazy? Like, I don't even know how I'd do it. Maybe I'd use like a howitzer or something. Like, do you know where I could get a howitzer? And he was like, what are you talking about? Like, maybe. Um, like, I, I just couldn't stop thinking about it, right? Like, something about this particular idea just really grasped me at like my innermost being. Um, and then even beyond just this sort of like leaning into my fate, if you will, mm -hmm. um, there are severe problems that without severe action um, will destroy, I think, our nation and civilization. Um, and there's enough people, you know, putzing around on B2B SaaS. There's enough people putzing around in finance. Um, there's enough people that, like, even in a cool company or industry are just wasting their life away and time. Um, and I, for whatever reason, just feel this deep visceral urge to try to make things better. I think in part it's related to like my obsession with Aurelian, the, the, the emperor that saved Rome from the third century crisis, right? Like there is the capability and we've seen it throughout history of like individuals to make decisions to take the weight upon the weight of the world upon their shoulders and, and try to fix things no matter how bleak they are, right? And like I'm a Zoomer, like deaths of despair, TikTok addiction, depression, like like incel dumb, right? Um, as bad as they have ever been, and like that's just the milieu that I grew up in, and that's so dissatisfactory to me, and it should be to everybody else. And so I, I just decided like there's no higher point of leverage by which I can try to make the world better than than getting rid of droughts, than stopping hurricanes, than suppressing wildfires. Um, like, and I'm the only person talking about it, so I'm going to do it. And I, I think um, I think that insofar as like. Uh, we ought to live a Christ-like life, right? Where like he took the weight of all of the world's sin upon his shoulders and like died for them. Um, I think that like a founder on a really ambitious endeavor probably ought to similarly view his endeavor as like an, an opportunity to be Christ-like and, and take as much possible responsibility, tackle the, the greatest possible problem. Um, there's this essay called Good Quests by Marky Wagner and Trey Stevens in, in Pirate Wires. Um, and they talk about like, well, you know, you should you should take a good quest. You should make your life like a good quest. You should build something that makes people's lives better, rather than you know, SaaS, fintech, whatever. Um, but like, what is a good quest? It's it's not just something that is like good. Like, what does it mean to be good? We kind of lost that. Like, it's something that helps establish the kingdom of God. And you can even be secular and like understand what that means, right? Like, this isn't just hapless religious fanaticism. This is like an understanding that the world is not as it should be. It's broken. We'll, we'll not in this life achieve utopia, but like we should, to the extent we can, try to build that with some discretion and caution. Um, and and I, I couldn't imagine a better way to do that in, in my life than with weather modification. Yeah, yeah amazing. There's like a, I was just gonna comment on the, the sort of connection between, just thinking historically, water and fixing droughts is always sort of this religious point for civilization right you you whether you're killing people to try to solve that as sacrifices or you're praying to yeah. Tlaloc or you're you know Elijah and Mount Carmel versus the priests of Baal yep. calling upon you know doing a duel between the two gods and seeing like who's got it there's there's a deep sort of primal need to solve you know the water problem and it's it's interesting to to see the overlap here. Still, obviously, we're Christians. Mm -hmm. I I think you're right. But uh, yeah, totally. Well, well, so we actually named our first drone the Elijah. 
um, Base. for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Awesome. yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Um, and, That's and so great. there's this interesting thing, too, um, like sort of Kabbalistic reading on the difference between Egypt and Israel, right? Is that like, well, Egypt relied on the Nile, right? Like this earthly source of water for its agriculture and for its sustenance. Like Israel didn't have such a river, like it relied on the rains, right? right. Which were provided from God as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, obviously I'm Christian, we're Christian, but like from a secular perspective, there's just some interesting symbology there as well. Absolutely. Huh. So, Kind of, you mentioned the B2B SaaS, people just floundering around on Twitter. There's a, or in tech, there's a, there's a market difference that uh, we've observed, uh, and you, you're sort of part of this, between, let's say, the 2010s uh, you know, founders and, and uh, investment side, where you're investing in a widget, you're investing in you know, pumping, pumping an app full of venture capital, trying to blast it to the moon, kind of boring and lame, uh, not really solving a lot of problems, making people rich, but not solving a lot of problems. There's now a market trend toward young dudes who are based, who are religious, who are building really hard companies. Uh, you're, you're part of this group, so why don't you talk a little bit about how you're seeing, if you're seeing the shift and what it, you know, what's costing I'm, it. I'm seeing it nowhere more potently than, El, than in El Segundo. Um, so, I urge you guys to come to El Segundo and like see it for yourself. Um, there are more ambitious dudes trying to solve really hard problems, right? Between like nuclear energy, like net zero hydrocarbon synthesis, like the most advanced defense systems you can imagine, um, like totally novel ways to automate all sorts of like factory production and manufacturing um there's uh yeah I won't, I won't spill too much alpha on this actually but um but but it is extremely potent there um i think in in large part because like of all the work that elon has done in building spacex and mm -hmm. then the subsequent founders that diffused from that and then the subsequent founders that even diffused right. from those companies and and just like the the glut of cracked engineering talent that's there um but but aside from like why it's happening in el segundo why this sensation of like really ambitious um even religious or just like people with zeal uh like, like why, why is this category of people more investable and more um prominent now than it was in the 2010s Credible, i would say too i mean it's just yeah 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 right sure um i think that like you know i uh i was a crypto bro once upon a time right and i was burned more than once <laughs> um and like we all saw sam bankman freed um we saw all these like big just scams um that i think has soured our appetite i think also it's just like um in in our heart of hearts and our conscience right apart from the macro condition like you can tell what's real and you can tell what's good um and no amount of software is really going to materially change the world as much as hardware and as much as things that you can physically interact with and like duh, 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 metaverse i'm sure that'll be great zuck is a lot wealthier and a lot smarter than i um but like apart from the sort of dystopian world where the metaverse becomes a big deal um you you, you need to create the future in in atoms um and so i think that we can all just intuit that uh, to, to to be honest um, like i don't even think that it's a uh, a macro condition that's given rise to this so much as it is just like something we've all known for a long time and now that there's no more zero interest rates like you, you have no alternative right <laughs> yeah no more copycat SaaS. uh in a good way the, the environment is gone for the good kind of drought so. yeah 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 and, and you know there's something else too yeah the good kind of drought there's something else too which is just that like i you know I'm an appreciator of capitalism, right? Like I am financially motivated, but really like, and I love my investors and I'm gonna give them great returns, but also like, I don't, I'm not in this for the money. Right. Like this has, you know, it's like, uh, 
it's like the Joker meme, right? It's like it's not about the money; it's about sending a message, right? And, it, and, and, the, and the message, right, is that like we can make the world better, and it's really up to you as an individual to to do something, not to talk about it, right? Because like there's plenty of group chat discussions, there's plenty of think boys. Um, like you, you have to choose. First, to acknowledge that like the world as it is with just SaaS and whatever else is insufficient and like needs to be improved upon. But then, but then after you acknowledge that, you need to move beyond just talking about it and and live it out and like take dominion over the world. Um, in in uh, but yeah, you, you just need to take dominion over the world. I think. Yeah, and that's a common theme for you: the Genesis Dominion Mandate, which is which is great. Um, like talk, you, you were mentioning at lunch, like the. We've taken dominion of Earth, mostly, yeah, but yeah, sure. not the seas and not the skies. Sure. So in in Genesis one twenty eight, right? Um, God gives man dominion over. Th this is this is the, the first thing that he says to to mankind. By the way, um, like he, he creates us and then uh, says to like rule and subdue the earth to take dominion over the uh, fish of the seas the birds of the heavens and every living thing that crawls on the earth. I don't know if that's a direct quote, forgive me, but but it's something to that effect. And, and yeah, like I was saying, I don't know, look around, like, okay, decent, decent. Like we, we have populated and taken dominion over the earth to, to some extent. I think we, we actually must be much better stewards of it than, than we have been. Like I think a very integral part of dominion is to like rule and interact with the world in a loving way like it's not symbiotic in the sense that like we're not equal with nature right um like i think that it is mankind's role to to govern it right. but not tyrannically not like no. to strip mine everything no it's that difference no. between dominion and domination it, it, exactly that that's the perfect dichotomy right like right. it is not in our nature to dominate nature um but but we have taken decent dominion, sometimes like tyrannized and destroyed the earth, um, but the seas, right, like where's where's the underwater cities that we were talking about, right, like nothing, you know, like why are there still tsunamis, who's working on this, um, there's that problem, and then, and then there's the heavens, which like in a local sense have to do with the atmosphere, and that's my primary concern for now. Um, and then there's like the the ultimate heavens, which is like space. Well, not the ultimate, but like no. you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, I think about dominion as it pertains to Rainmaker in that like we were given this command by God to take dominion, to subdue like the heavens, and we haven't. And so what that means is that whenever there is a drought, a wildfire, some inclement weather that harms people. That's not just like the state of the world and and something that we have to live with and like it, it's not part of the it it's part of the fall but it's not um, a part of the fall that we cannot remediate right um, it is actually our shirking of responsibility to take this dominion that leads to suffering of people and so I think that like you and I like live with the guilt or we ought to live with the guilt of having allowed a world to persist wherein like people suffer from hurricanes right like that is a circumstance that should not persist mm -hmm. yeah we're talk talking to eric prince last week and he a big part of what he what he told us one of the kind of early missions that he ran especially domestically was katrina help and connecting thinking about this about what he was saying uh in the context of this conversation it's like in the 20 tense you know eric or maybe when was katrina it's like 2000 2009 it was yeah it was around that time yeah 2009 so like in that you know early or late 2000s uh you have eric prince helping people who've been affected by this but now we're getting to the point where somebody's actually like what if there was no hurricane at all what if there was what if the storm just didn't happen mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. what if there was not there's a so there's a book called the wizard and the prophet that you're probably right, familiar yeah. with have read mm -hmm. it okay so uh, for those of who haven't, the idea being that there's wizards uh, who believe that we should harness tech uh, and use it for good and change the environment, and then prophets saying, if you do that, things are going to turn bad, you're going to have unintended consequences. Um, you're obviously on the wizard side, <laughs> generally, but how do you think about that split in your work? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually... Um... I don't think I would call myself a techno-optimist. Okay. Um, 
You guys are familiar with EAC? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't be on Twitter for like half a second without <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. EAC. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Are exactly. we with us or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, shout out Beth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would I'd say I'm probably EAC, um, but I, I don't think I'm a techno optimist. Um, like, I don't think that there's anything inherently good about technologies. Um, I think that what technology does is it allows you to do more with less or to do things that you previously couldn't, it just extends like man's capability, right? And like if we understand that man is made up of both like the flesh and the divine image within him, we have the capability for both evil, right, and malevolence and selfishness and every other vice, right? Um, and good, right? Like to, to act out the absolute best in altruism and love and generosity. And so um you know, I, I think that uh, I think that I would like to I think that I would like to be seen as a wizard rather than a prophet. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> funny, funny thing to clip. Um, I, I'd, I'd like I'd like to be seen as a wizard rather than like a, a, a techno pessimist because I think that if we're in right standing with our nature and with nature and with other people, um, it's clearly evident that technology can do good. Um, I don't think that wanton weather modification is good. Like, I don't think that uh, without any regard for climatological studies, without any regard for unintended consequences, uh, we should be performing weather modification. Um, I don't think that uh, the existing atmospheric modeling that exists is robust as it should be. Now that said, it has plenty of predictive power. We can make relatively confident assertions about the outcomes of these different seeding events, but like at, at a micro, meso, macro scale, mm -hmm. like more resources need to be done. It need to be need to be dedicated to like ensuring that this tech is safe and uh, like the ways in mm -hmm. which we can apply mm -hmm. it safely are well understood. Um, so I that think, gets back to dominion versus domination. Yeah, right? like dominion is a wise taking of a totally of a space rather than you know yolo. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Squeeze those clouds. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> Which like, I, I I don't know. Is the CCP the party that we want to like have exclusive control mm -hmm. over this technology? Um, probably not. Probably not, right? I'm going to venture um, a guess. Is yeah, there, yeah. Is, yeah. Is, do you have a sense of um, how Zero Summit is, like between us and China, for instance, uh, in terms of the ecosystem? If they were really just going crazy, no restrictions, would that affect other countries? It's hard to say. Yeah. It's hard to say. Yeah. What do you see as the ideal, like, let's say, five, ten years from now? Um, you said, you know, on one side, unrestricted, negative use of this tech versus what you'd like to see. What does that look like? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the, the people that have concerns about weather modification generally have like one of three varieties. Um, they're either worried about like zero sum seeding, right? Like some, some precipitation occurring over here rather than it occurring where it would have otherwise, right? So, so that's one concern. Another concern um, is uh, like unnecessary pollutants being added to the atmosphere, right? right? Um, and then the third thing Otherwise is- Otherwise known as turning the frogs gay. <laughs> Has been called that. that. Where, where's yeah. that from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, then, and, then the third, and then the third thing is um, like just this sort of generalized anxiety about like playing God, right? And sure. just like messing with things we don't understand. Um, and so to, to the first party, right? Like, I, I, I guess I'll say like, what are the three bad outcomes? Like, what are the three ways, what are the ways in which these three things can result in like the, the bad future outcome for weather mod? Um, one, like if you don't do the appropriate atmospheric modeling um, and if you seed far too aggressively in a given area, you can prevent precipitation from occurring where it would have otherwise, and you might not have necessarily added like a totally positive amount to the grid. So like every time a cloud is blowing from one point to another, should you seed it just because you can? Um, no, 
But like if, if the interests of weather modification were exclusively and totally private and there was no regard for the public good, there's a potential bad outcome there. Um, the second problem to consider is like, well, what if we just use like plutonium as a cloud seeding agent, right? And just irradiate everything or something similarly right. toxic. Something negative. Yeah. Um, I am grateful that nothing in the status quo is actually like that severely toxic. Um, but like, if there are alternative nucleation agents designed, they should be at least as safe as those that are currently used that like the Cal EPA is approved of, mm -hmm. um, if not more so. And, and so the bad outcome is like somebody designed something that's more effective that is not as, as eco-friendly and needlessly pollutes. Um, and then the third thing is like, well, you know, maybe maybe you get like a what's it called ice nine um, like that old that that Neil Stevenson mm -hmm. idea where like you mm -hmm. accidentally freeze the world or right. have some crazy unanticipated outcome right. where like like in the Manhattan Project when they thought destroy they might, the world yeah they right. thought they might like light the atmosphere on right. fire so so like there's these there's these three potential bad outcomes where you see like people fighting over water rights and excessive pollution going on and like unintended consequences mm -hmm. um, now. Um, I say this with like as much of a request from like, like I say this with as much humility as I possibly can. And I, I want as much criticism and feedback from the scientific community, from the environmental community, from like any stakeholders over like in areas where weather modification could occur. Um, I think there's plenty of ways to address these problems. So like first with respect to, uh, positive sum seeding versus zero sum seeding. Like the marine cloud layer, right? Like that stuff that blows in from the coasts and recedes, bl blows in the morning, recedes in the afternoons. Um, there are millions of acre feet of water uh, in that marine cloud layer alone that never precipitates, sort of just gets cycled around mm -hmm. the coasts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, seeding that alone would so severely offset, so significantly offset coastal California's water demand that like it could become autonomous from the Colorado River. Um, so like there are positive some cases both on the coasts and then in the interior where because you see it in one place, the convection from the coasts increases, you can get more water blown into the interior. You, you can have positive some seeding. So, so I would say that provided you do something safely, like you can ensure that, it, that, that it's positive some and everybody gets more water. Second thing is like the existing nucleation agents, right? Like people know about silver iodide. Um, if you're using single digit kilograms of the stuff over tens or hundreds of thousands of acres, um, first of all, it's immeasurably trace amounts, um, even if you use it a few dozen times per season. Um, and so it's barely quantifiable. The impact then you would imagine to be de minimis, turns out it is de minimis in these quantities. If you have a gargantuan dose, then you start to get antibacterial properties in silver iodide because of the silver. Um, not a concern for a long time, but that said, like Rainmaker is developing new nucleation agents that are significantly safer and perhaps even healthy um, to introduce into the environment. So, so that addresses like the pollution question, um, and you know we should see how this stuff behaves at the macro and all that. But but generally, you can ensure that your chemicals are safe. And then the third thing with respect to like the generalized anxiety about playing God, my answer to that camp of folks is generally like, well, you know, option one is we progress down the path that we're on that is known, right? And that path involves, for better or worse, the destruction of Las Vegas um, and every other Western American city, which is probably for worse definitively. No. Um, like there will be less agriculture, people's quality of living will be reduced, food exports from the United States will be reduced, so the rest of the world will undergo a famine, we ourselves will be subject to increased food prices, housing prices will go through the roof because everybody will have to right. leave the West, um, it'll destroy all the ecosystems in the West, right? Like this is not purely for the sake of mankind. This is also for the sake of conserving and stewarding our environment. Like at the Colorado River and the Colorado River Delta and everything that is supported by it in nature will die. Um, and that is known. And we know that that will happen in the status quo. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, we can do something that is not tested and not as well known or, or, or not as yeah, not as well known, relatively well tested, with predictable outcomes that we can adjust in real time if we find it going for better or worse. Um, and then maybe we have a shot at preventing like the collapse of the American West and the collapse of all of its ecosystems and agriculture. And so um, the good outcome that I see in five years is one where 
there is as much, if not more, agriculture uh, in the American West as there is now. Like, frankly, I, I am an almond maximalist. Like, people have decided to pick a fight with almond farmers, mm -hmm. right? And, like, the solution is not to stop farming almonds. It's just give them more water, right? Like, make more water so that everybody has more water. So, like, it, it's one with more agriculture. It's one where there's no concerns about endangered species in the Colorado River Delta or Delta smelt in, like, the Sacramento Delta or any other ecosystem, for that matter. And, and it's one where, hopefully, um, we can begin to undertake projects and this is the sort of like five to ten year time scale where we can undertake projects more significant than just like those related to our immediate economy and instead like terraforming and and things that we can aspire towards a la you know mars or, or really the sort of civilizational scale stuff that um you know I, I hope that my descendants can look back on like with pride yeah that's sweet so as you're talking about this the opportunity within the broad space there's the new agents, uh, nuclear agents. There's the delivery uh, of the of whatever the chemical is to to the clouds. Mm -hmm. There's the policy side. There's there seems like the surface of potential opportunities across just this domain is pretty broad. Which ones are you actually tackling? Yes, uh, <laughs> and uh, and why are you starting with those? Uh, yeah, all of them. Yeah. All of them. Um, part of the appeal of starting Rainmaker was it was the hardest thing I, I could work on. Nice. Um, so uh, um, technologically, right? Like there's uh, cloud seeding in the status quo, where people, you know, basically have some putsy, run-of-the-mill meteorological software, the kind of stuff you'd see at like any weather station. Not specific to cloud seeding, um, and that's how we identify cloud seeding opportunities. So that, that's a disaster. It's too in specific, and it has no ability to predict what the yields of seeding will be, right? Like you should be able to predict mm -hmm. what the yields will be, so that like at the very least you know, and then also you can like price the and sell what yeah. you produce. Yeah, exactly. So we're building better software. We're using satellite data and open source radar right now as inputs for that, um, so that we can identify where in the clouds exactly have the highest potential yields. Um, so there's the software component. There's the delivery component, right? So we're using drones. Um, Right now, we're using off-the-shelf stuff that'll probably continue for a while. Um, uh, all American-made, and um, that reduces the cost, increases the precision, and subsequently increases the yield and cost-effectiveness of seeding rather than planes. Um, we're developing these new chemical agents that are more cost-effective, more eco-friendly, and more specifically useful in different like aerosol contexts. Right, so like Southern Arizona has a different like naturally occurring uh, aerosol regime than like northern Colorado. And so you, you can tune what you're dispersing to be specifically more useful in those different contexts. And then also instead of using flares, the traditional means by which you like aerosolize this chemical and get it to stay in the cloud longer, um, where we have like an alternative piece of hardware to, to aerosolize it um, without uh, needing pyrotechnics to be strapped onto our drones. So, so that's like all of the tech that we're building out. Um, we have a spectacular team. I'm so grateful that we do. Um, like great aerosol chemist, great computational chemist, um, great atmospheric modeler and scientist right now. Great like BD. Um, we're hiring a chemical engineer right now. If you know any, let me know. Um, if you know any like great people with super just ambitious um, dispositions, then like send them my way too. Um, you can apply on our LinkedIn. Um, but uh, but like that's all the stuff that we're trying to solve on the tech side. Um, on the policy side, we're working with both universities and regulatory bodies so that we can get like the FAA, NOAA, EPA uh, sign off that we need. Um, we're also trying to do all the BD stuff, which is like, well, you know, farms individually might need more water. Hydroelectric watersheds might need more water. Um, farms and cities might want hail suppressed. Um, and then beyond that, even like insurers that are trying to uh, like State Farm doesn't insure homes in California anymore. I don't know if you knew that because mm. actuaries couldn't figure out any premium that justified the risk of wildfire. Hmm. Um, like su suppressing wildfires in conjunction with like Cal Fire and insurers is another thing that we're, we're looking to do mm -hmm. on, on the BD side. So um, yeah, this, this is a titanic project. Like I'm pretty, it's crazy like at 23 to say like, this is my magnum opus. I'm gonna spend my life doing this. Um, but I, I don't think that I will have enough time um, to do a whole lot else if no. I want to see this to the fruition. Do you have like a set target per uh, per yield, uh, cost per yield that you're, you're shooting for? I'm thinking of like Elon, 
he was like, I don't know, I don't remember the exact original number, but with the space shuttle, price per kilogram, you know, in orbit was like, I don't know, 150K. He's brought it down to like 10K mm. and wants to go down to even like 100 bucks with Starship. So do you have, if you can share, like what the, what yeah. the economics are yeah, sure. like, I'm a farmer, I want rain, how much is it gonna cost me? Press, yeah. that, press that button. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know? sure, sure. So um, farmers use uh, acre feet as like the okay. uh, metric by which they measure water. And you can imagine like one acre of land covered in a foot of water yeah. is about 325,000 gallons. Um, initially, uh, we plan to produce water around like $14 per acre foot. Um, and this varies wildly depending on like the geography that you're in. Like in Colorado, we can produce water much cheaper. In Idaho, we can produce water mm -hmm. much cheaper. In San Diego, way less cloud coverage, way fewer opportunities to seed, much more expensive. Would that be $14 for, for a full acre covered yeah. in a, in a full of water? Okay. Yeah, it's wow. like Correct. search pricing for Uber, but for rain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're like, sorry, there's less cloud <laughs> coverage. <laughs> Price exactly. is going up, exactly. boys. Yeah, yeah but, but, but water is still relatively inexpensive. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually, we want to push this down to, well, eventually we want water to be too cheap to meter, um, a la the, the energy guys. But um, I think that like a reasonable target is a dollar per acre foot in the course of a few years um, in geographies where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, because right now, uh, like the Cal State Water Project and its irrigation districts, which are like bodies that are subject to it, they sell water for anywhere between like two and seven dollars. Um, ish and then uh, if you exceed your budgets for, for what you're given for the year then then it starts to get up closer to you know anywhere from 20 to 50 to 500 dollars per acre foot mm. um, that's cool do you so you talk about weather being kind of like knobs that we could modify what things do you in your research or early on so far maybe changes in five years but from what you guys have looked at what things do you think we really can't tinker with? Not that we can in terms of like morally we shouldn't, but they're just sets, they're constants, nothing we can do about that. It sounds maybe like cloud coverage is a little bit of that, but mm. I don't know, talk about that. Yeah, it's a lot harder to get water vapor up than it is down. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is something that we'll probably, you know, take a swing at in like five years, maybe sooner. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty pretty tough to make clouds right now. There's some people in like Israel and uh, Australia that are giving it a go, um, but that's fairly difficult. Um, local heating and cooling, um, kind of difficult um, to, to to do within any uh, amount that is noticeable by people, right? Like, um, I don't think that we're gonna quickly figure out how to handle like heat waves um, or, or cold waves. Um, that seems pretty rough. Um, but I think eventually like you sort of have to axiomatically believe that it can be solved. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have that attitude and just say like, you know, it, it has to be solved, like, like the sort of Elon like, um, you know, I'm not an optimist or a pessimist, like I just have to get it done. Um, like if you take that attitude with it, I, I suspect eventually we'll be able to figure it out, but but I don't yet know how. No. So how are you, I'm curious about the team you're assembling, because in some of these really cool industries like this, you, uh, Tommy and Dalian, it was some, somewhat similar, but um, uh, like this is a project as you've described, a lot of science was done in the 70s, no one's, it's not really advanced. And then as, if I think of, at a macro level, like where guys like that would, could be good fits for you know, solving this problem, if someone's like a great uh, meteorologist or whatever, they're not necessarily gonna be driven to be in a startup, high risk startup with uh, their meteorologist. So they're gonna be you know, yeah, yeah. in somewhere. So like, how, are you, how are you going about assembling your team and finding guys who are like, bro, this is it, you know? <laughs> Putting my yeah. life down on the line to do this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, for one, um, crazy project though it is, uh, I'm grateful that we're well capitalized enough that, you know, I don't have to go to people and say like, I got this crazy idea, and <laughs> right. maybe it's gonna die in a year, but like, we'll yeah. give it a go. Like, we're, th yeah. that's not a risk for people. Right. So that that actually um, has made it easier to recruit. Yes. Um, then, yeah, the question is like, well. 
how do you source people for an industry that doesn't exist yet, right? right? And you look to the other instances in industry where the tech is sufficiently analogous that you can port it over. Um, so I guess, I guess one that I can share, or some that I'm not going to because we're like actively, is poaching is legal in all states, right? Like, like poaching people? It's... Is Leo there some from, from companies? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, California. Un, you know, unsure. I can never. You can never definitively say. Like, okay. All right. Well. Uh, I, yeah. Whatever. I'm poaching people from other companies right now, and I'm not going to say which. <laughs> right. Um, but one person that works for us previously worked for Jewel. Um, interestingly enough, all the people that know the most about cloud chemistry and cloud physics and aerosol chemistry. Uh, that leave academia, go and work at vape companies. Um, <laughs> and so like in, in, in that sense, you can look and say like, okay, clouds, where do clouds exist in industry? Like the weather station, oh, and also in vapes. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, exactly. So we're, we're kind of taking that approach to both like drone design, software design, um, dispersion hardware design, like where in industry is there something that looks at all like this? Um, because, because you're right, like, it's weird in that like maybe Varda or SpaceX, right? Like they could go to existing primes or they could go to other large like hardware manufacturers um, that build like rocket nozzles or something. Uh, not us, there, there's, there's, no, there's no big prominent rain making companies yet. Although actually wait, so diverging a little bit, um, there's something called the Royal, uh, there's something called the Department of Royal Rainmaking in Thailand I just like yes. keep trying to get this off my chest. It's <laughs> so cool. It's so cool, right? Yes. Like I hope that someday when we win, I, yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we we get a royal rain making department. Um, but yeah, all that to say, um, just porting over uh, people in niche components of existing industries where the tech is the same. Um, and so like, there's some stuff in automotive that's the same. Um, there's some stuff in pharma that's the same. Um, there's some stuff in like energy, um, particularly like oil that's similar. And so we're looking in places like that. What do you, uh, what do you think, what did you want to do instead of this? You're going to college, like I'm talking way before your first company and now this. Mm. What was, what was Augusta's doing at 23? Or did you just go yeah. straight from Legos to just <laughs> straight <laughs> into uh, uh, rain uh, like, boom. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I was sucking on my thumb. I was playing with Legos <laughs> and then I did this. No, um, well, so I would say now, like there's this Luke Combs song that I like um, called If I Wasn't Doing This, hmm. right? And like the whole premise of that song is like some interviewer asks him like, well, if you weren't, you know, this rock star, what would you be up to? Expect him to say like, I'd play golf or something. And like, he was like, no, I'd work in like a small bar or something like playing these same songs every Friday night. Um, and like, if it boiled down to it, uh, at this point, um, you know, years into the future, for whatever reason, if this wasn't working out, like I would apply for a job at like the UAE rain enhancement program or the like Thai department of Royal rainmaking. And I'd, I'd be working on this. Like, this is it for now. Now that said, like before I figured out about weather mod or water or anything. Um, yeah, when you were at Caltech doing data science. Uh, uh, Berkeley, Berkeley, Berkeley. Yeah, Cal, Cal, yeah. Uh, Cal Berkeley. Yeah. Um, you know, so originally uh, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, and I wanted to be an astronaut, one, obviously, because it's sick. Um, two, uh, and more like esoterically, because I had bought into the idea that like, well, I don't have answers. I wasn't Christian, by the way, like up until just a couple of years ago. Um, I bought into these ideas about how, um, like, well, I don't know what the meaning of life is, but like the more knowledge we can garner, the better we'll be able to answer these questions about the nature of life and, and living and, and what the good life is. Um, and so the way to ensure we have the maximum amount of time to investigate these questions is to make humanity multiplanetary so we're more robust and can live longer. The best way for me to help facilitate that is to become an astronaut. And so I wanted to become an astronaut. Um, I wanted to become an astronaut by going to the Naval Academy because the demographic of people most commonly selected for astronaut school are naval test pilots. So I did the full senatorial nomination thing, applied, got in, um, uh, 
but I'm deaf in this ear, so I was medically disqualified from being a test pilot, so that, that, that couldn't work. It was pretty devastating. Next best option was um, becoming a physicist, as per the direction of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I thought I would do, crazy amounts of hubris from like an 18-year-old. I was like, well, I'm just going to settle this God debate once and for all with physics. <laughs> you know? And I was like, yeah. I, this has never been tried before. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> Well, because well, it was like, I remember thinking something ridiculous to the effect of like, Heisenberg said, when you take your first drink from the glass that is the natural sciences, you find atheism, but down there at the bottom of the glass, you find God staring back at you. And I was like, well, I, he just didn't fully articulate what he meant. Like, where's yeah. the God thing then? I'll just get to the bottom of the drink. And then um, I pretty quickly realized like, oh, that has, this has nothing to do with the metaphysical question. Not nothing to do, but almost nothing to do with the metaphysical questions that I have, right? Like the, the Sam Harris idea that you can extrapolate morals from facts um, or scientifically verifiable facts, nonsense. Um, and so I was pretty distraught about that for a long time because I was uh, like the Reddit tier atheist, right? And I was like, well, just with, with facts and logic, I will sort this out. And um, I couldn't. And uh, I, I actually spent about a year um, talking to rabbis, pastors, priests, and imam, trying to figure out um, if there was any objectivity at all in the world religions. Um, and so uh, grateful that I settled on the right one. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I actually, um, I view, yeah, I, I, I think that I was very inclined towards philosophy and I was just trying to live that out in action. Like there's this Dr. Zhivago quote that I also can't remember, but basically somebody says to him like, you know the movie Dr. Zhivago? No. Okay. It's, it. it's like this, uh, pre-Russian revolution doctor, right? Like he's a romantic and a poet, but he's a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's yeah. like, wow, your, your poetry is spectacular. And like, there's this real literary culture at the time in Russia. And they're like, you should just, you should just write. Like that should be your career. And he says something to the effect of like, I forget, but it's like, you know, uh, poetry is like a, a leisure that I am only concerned with after like the work and science has been done. Right. And so like, I think I've always been philosophically inclined, um, but but always felt obliged to because I had the capacity to like participate in hard sciences that, that move the needle in a particular fashion. And I don't think that, like, I think that another bad meme is like, well, you can either be concerned about technology or like liberal arts, right? Like <laughs> right. The, the word yes. cell or yes. uh, shape rotator. Yes. Like, no, be... Por que no los dos? Yeah, exactly. Por que no los dos, right? Like, just, just be, be normal. Be normal. Yeah. Think about... Normalize this. Normalize yeah. that. Why aren't you just normal? Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. exactly. Well, exactly. and that's the original scientist, too, were that combination of it, philosophy exactly. and heart right. attack. Exactly. So, so actually, like, what do you guys... What's your read on... Um, you know, you mentioned before, like, this sort of, like, new archetype of founder guy, mm -hmm. right? Like, what's your read on the extent to which they are concerned with like the liberal arts and things just beyond hardware like what does that feel like to the outsider like does it feel like we care about things beyond like at the very least like just american dynamism you know or like i think so uh i mean just chatting with people individually uh in, in fact most times when i chat with folks the new founder archetype it's not you only find out that they're a founder later in life or, or later in the conversation or if you're not a founder type event but you'll start talking about something interesting uh, mm -hmm. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm building this company or I built, you know, three other companies or whatever. It, it's much less like, hey, nice to meet you. Here's my pitch deck. You know, mm -hmm. I'm building the next copycat SaaS. Uh, do you, would you mm -hmm. like a term sheet? You know, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I appreciate that, especially coming from a liberal arts background. Uh, both of us mm -hmm. have that. that. Uh, yeah, it seems like. Yeah. A, I think a so, shift. especially. Especially the guys we've talked to that are in your particular circles are very much that way. Broader, I mean, I think American dynamism has gotten really sexy in the last couple of years. And so now you're going to get just a lot more people in mm -hmm. there, period. But I think by definition... Um, and Catherine famously doesn't like the liberal arts as much. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a, a tweet mm -hmm. storm yeah. about that. But, yes. um, 
we were talking to a previous guest who talked about you know advantages of business coming out of either innovation or efficiency or integration slash high excellence. Mm. And so, you know, as much as we trash on the SaaS folks, like what they're going for there is high efficiency. Like they're taking the tech, they're making something slightly better at scale. Um, and then, you know, the third one has been around forever in terms of high excellence. We're just going to do the best possible job. Ideally, the, a good company has all three. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the people who are tackling that first one, innovation, are going to be naturally curious. And I think that type of person is going to have philosophical questions. They're going to be probably broader read, and that's going to lead them into something where they find a problem that they want to solve. So, mm -hmm. um, is, there, is there anything you think that founders should read? Napoleon's biographies. Mm. Yeah. That's a solid Napoleon's point. biographies. There's also uh, Paper Belt on Fire mm -hmm. by Michael Gibson, mm -hmm. who's going to be on the pod the next couple mm -hmm. weeks. It's yeah. a banger. Yeah. Big guy. Yeah. Um, there's also a book. Well, you, I'm trying to remember the title. Mm -hmm. um, John Askinus recommended it before we spoke with him. Uh, by the same guy. I'm forgetting if you guys remember the title. It's the same author of Everything Bad is Good for You. Or, sorry, I'm using ourselves to death, Neil Postman. Mm -hmm. uh, the book. So Neil wrote another book called, and I forget the title, but it's very good. It's about the history of, uh, kind of a little bit what you were saying earlier. How have humans, how has the relationship between humans and technology evolved over time? So you have, he tracks out like, you know, humans developing technology as one kind of strata, then there's humans working with technology, then there's humans becoming sort of weirdly symbiotic with technology, and then lastly, it's like humans being catechized by their technology, I suppose, the other way around. Mm -hmm. And so it tracks in a good way for me, I think, as you think of founders, like, you know, the the bumpers, like, you know, the on the one end is like just use a club to break a nut. That's that's kind of lame. We're past that. On the other bumper, though, is like your technology catechizes you, like shapes your soul. Mm -hmm. That's where you got to be careful. So technology in its own is not good. How do you? It's in the middle. Like when you use it, when you shape it, when you take dominion of it, that it that it performs the best. Mm -hmm. I forget the title. I'll have to look mm -hmm. it up, but. What do, you, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I mean, th those are good ones. The classic one is zero to one, right? I think mm -hmm. that's that's always good base reading. Um, I mean, big picture, just understanding the world, history of civilization. Like, I guess now we're getting into the liberal arts thing, but that's invaluable in terms of... The answer uh, can be liberal arts books, by the way. It doesn't have to be like right. founder books. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, for sure. Technopoly. Uh, yeah. I just uh, asked uh, Got a friend Google over here. Technopoly yeah. by Neil Postman. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, it's a good one. So uh, uh, Xenophon is amazing. Um, Xenophon. I think everyone should read Thucydides. Thucydides, History of the Peloponnesian mm -hmm. War is Incredible. like. Doesn't matter what you do, you should read that. Specifically, book. when you're saying that, and this is this seems to be a theme now across the founder archetype is this notion, this understanding. Simon talked about this on our podcast, you know, friend here. Um, of the ability, like resurgence, or, or of, of the idea, or the concept that, that, especially as a guy, like you can exert will upon the world, and that's a good thing. Um, there's ways to do it that are bad and sinful and wrong. There's ways that are uh, uh, similarly, it's, it's bad to not do it in some in some many cases. But uh, Thucydides is, and much of the the canon of like liberal arts is about how do you understand the world so that you can exert. You move a lever, press a button, okay. shape it in a particular direction. Yeah. Uh, and I would say, I would frame it as taking responsibility and taking agency to go solve problems. I don't like will, because that's like a Nietzsche. Like the, <laughs> that is like a very yeah, obvious way like Nietzsche. Nietzsche. I'm the yeah. Nietzsche in bumpers. I'm like, yeah. let's not yeah. let's not do that. But yeah, responsibility and agency. We're Nietzsche. For Nietzsche's sure. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> I remember I was... Uh, I was 15 when I read when I read uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and I I remember picking it up and I was like I don't understand. <laughs> I look so <laughs> smart. <laughs> and then like sort of back and actually uh, understood yeah. later. Um, understood, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Nietzsche's good. Nietzsche's good. Dude. Anything you would like to mean like reading Nietzsche on the subway, but but. For the record, I love his prose. It's like no, a ton of fun really to read, good. but yeah. uh, no. but you got to have that anchor. So yeah, yeah. Anything that you've read thus far that has been super pivotal for you? Mm. Um, I would say. 
Yeah, I was, I was starting to say like, well, as a founder versus as a person, but like actually those are that those are the same. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Notes from the Underground probably was the most impactful book on me. I think, um, I think that you know this is relevant to the sort of like um, techno optimism, techno pessimism question, right? Like I, I, I think that. Did you read that before you were a Christian or after you were? Before. Okay. Before, yeah, yeah. Um, I was like pretty much sold on Christianity before I thought God was real. Um, but uh, I think that. To be a good steward, you probably ought to be keen to like your capacity for evil and malevolence. Um, and so this is true in tech, in stewarding in any yeah. resource, in relationship. Um, so that was very impactful to me. Um, and like understanding the, the depths of man's capacity for depravity. Like that, that's very, I think, important to understand. Um, and then and then I think another thing that I think that, that I read relatively recently, which has been of particular import lately, is I like am undergoing this project of like forging El Segundo into. So, like, my friends and I talk about El Segundo, right? Like, in LA, like, in a way that compares El Segundo and hard tech now to Milan and the Renaissance in like 1400. Mm -hmm. um, there's this book called The Europeans. Mm -hmm. You've read this? Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Okay, about about the the sort of social scene of high art in yeah. Europe and how that related to industry and spread. Um, that gave me a lot of context on how to create a scene and a culture that facilitated technological growth, um, high mindedness, high aspirations, high culture. Um, that has been useful lately because I'm, I'm, you know, there's, there's this sort of scene that is emergent, uh, but trying to bring that all together, um, bring all the fellas together, right? Like that, that was informative recently. A real GC. Yeah. Yes. Yes. A GC, <laughs> IRL, the network <laughs> state, but actually this time. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And monetize the GC. No, yes. Yes. Um, yes. Exactly. Uh, yeah. The other book, I don't know if you've read this, but the other book that's cool to read in general, but especially if you're thinking tinkering with tech, technology, innovation, I guess that that hideous strength by C. S. Lewis. I haven't read it. Okay. Well that's yeah. uh on your on your read list now for yeah. the okay. for winter break. Yeah. It's a very good book. Yeah, very good one. C. S. Lewis. Uh, sure. It's the end of the, the space trilogy, the ransom trilogy. Mm. So uh, but it can be read on its own. It's very good. Okay, so, yeah. The uh, the Great Divorce definitely helped me oh, along yeah. with like my eschatology as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's canonical. I, he, he says explicitly it's not canonical, but yeah, no, yeah, yeah it's for sure useful heuristics. Wow. Till we have faces, while we're plugging CS. Yeah, 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 also yeah, incredible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, three Christian bros get on a podcast. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, yes. yes. You know, like says Lewis, delete your episode. So okay, so on the on the topic of El Segundo, is it Segundo? Segundo. Segundo. Yeah. Segundo. Okay. Um, so you guys are in that community, you're working up, I mean, you're very early, you've been working on this for just a couple of years, but anything- Six months, six months. Yeah, well, so, but in the space. Okay, sure. Um, as, like, I, I'm thinking as a founder, generally, mm -hmm. but anything you would tell your early self at this point that would have helped you out, or things that you've, milestones you've reached along the way that have changed how you've operated, um, mm. trying to think, you know, if there's guys who are like two or three years behind you in development, if there's things that would be helpful for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boy, man, yeah. Like every month I look back at who I was a month ago, I'm like, wow, yeah. you were an idiot. Like there's just so many mistakes that, just unforced errors, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of which, like you learn the lesson multiple times, or you don't learn the lesson, mm -hmm. but are aware of the lesson you right. ought to have learned oh, multiple yeah. times. So, um, so uh, one thing that I think I would have told myself is like, uh, and maybe this is also like, uh, yeah, I'll just say this for the sake of anybody that hasn't heard this before, like fundraising actually doesn't matter. Um, not in that it doesn't matter, but in that like, what you're trying to do is you're trying to build a product, you're trying to impact the world insofar as funds 
can facilitate that, like, good. Um, but startup culture really just idolizes, like, term sheets over uh, doing the thing. And so I would say that um, you can do a lot more with a lot less, uh, which isn't to say that, like, you shouldn't raise lots if you can or if um, it is not. Like, if you need the funds, then you need the funds. But um, try to do more with less. Try to fundraise less. That'll enable you to fundraise more. Um, there's that. Uh, another consideration is, like, just, like, lean on mentors much more aggressively. Um, I think that we're all to some extent posturing as, you know, like relatively successful guys that just accomplished X, Y, Z. Um, and in reality, I don't know, like if you're between 18 and 40, you really haven't seen all too much. And there's some really smart people um, that have just the ability to pattern map. Like, so I was listening to Scott Bannister talk recently mm -hmm. and he, he said something like, uh, yeah, I, I basically have no insights of my own. I, I'm just sort of like this repository of YouTube videos where I take an input, search through the database, and then can like click play and say this thing that somebody else told me a long time ago. Um, and like, if you just meet mentors like that, and that's lean, the liberal arts, by the way, in a nutshell. Yeah, it's literally yes, <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. But you're instead of going to like PayPal mafia people, you're going to like <laughs> like uh, yeah, like Resistance or something. Mafia, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, thousands of years ago. Um, so, so it would probably be like uh, build the thing rather than be concerned about fundraising for the thing. Um, lean into mentors much more aggressively, uh, much more aggressively be willing to sound stupid. Like I was in a circumstance not even too long ago where we uh, were trying to design this particular piece of hardware and one of my engineers asked like, well, um, or like one of the engineers we were contracting actually um, was like, well, like what is this specific parameter that you need? Like what's the, what's the tolerances? And I spent like three days banging my head against a wall trying to figure this out, but like I didn't have exactly the right background um, and I didn't want to tell him because it was like, ah, I'm employing right. you and I didn't want to go to a mentor right. because I wasn't listening to my own advice. Anyway, like three days into this sort of rigmarole, I was just like, yeah, no, I, I don't know. Here's some thoughts. And we hashed it out and solved it and like, 45 minutes of conversation. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe maybe these are, are really redundant, but um, yeah, just like act, be willing to act much stupider than you think is appropriate. Like you, you don't need to posture as much as you realize. Lean into mentors. Like I think some people have made some great observations about how like any of the kings of Silicon Valley have had king makers. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, uh, and then like just do the thing. Do the thing, money will come if you if you do the thing. And and there's something to be said for being articulate and, and charismatic and, and having like a narrative about how you're gonna change the world. But um, if you do the thing, that will facilitate uh, all the rest. So so those three come to mind. Work out, go to church, call your mom. Those ones are probably more important than any, any of the previous three I mentioned. So No sea oils. Yeah. Dude, honestly, <laughs> don't leave this episode. Are we, <laughs> yeah. I just, I just, like, yes, but also um, the seed oil thing is kind of like, okay, bad for sure, but it's also like, also, we can just we can just be normal sometimes, right? Like, and not everything has to be so imbued with this like schizo lifestyle stuff. Like, I drink the raw milk, I eat the raw eggs, I don't cook my beef sometimes. Like, I'll take a break on the seed oils when I want some like yep. slop from McDonald's, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Ch tip on that: Chick Fil A has the highest protein per mm. dollar amount of any Chick-fil-A nuggets specifically, okay, especially the good ones. Highest protein per dollar amount of protein in any of the kind of fast food That's nugget. big. Yeah, so. That's really big, okay. Yeah, that's a, I break my seal rule a lot there because it's, uh -huh. you can get a lot I'd of protein. I'd be curious, Chick-fil-A versus protein. Raisin Cane's? Has it been mm, compared That's a canes? good question. I have not looked at Raisin Cane's. Yeah, Cane's, that's, that's good chicken. Yeah, I need to look at <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Yeah. Uh, so, two, last two questions we ask everyone on the pod. And this is sort of within your domain. It can be rainmaking, but it can also be broadly like just building, you know, the new, the new uh, 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 scene of, of builders and founders. Uh, the black pill and the white pill question. Black pill is sort of what's worse than most people realize. Uh, mm. Nobody's capable. Not nobody. Um, 
very few people are capable. Um, maybe, maybe you think you understand how incapable. <sighs> Probably sounds really, really rough, like uh, pretentious. So sorry if it comes off like that. Um, but, but like. There is a, a real dearth of capability in every domain um, that is probably worse than you imagine. And the, the consequence of that is like if you even have the slightest capacity, like if you, if you do the minimum, if you do the absolute minimum of what is in your job description, you are 75th percentile performer, um, if not higher. So I think that's sort of like a societal black pill, but just means you have more responsibility if, if you are capable um, and more onus on you if you're not capable to become it. Um, with respect to water, um, yeah, with respect to water, uh, I'm pretty sure that if Rainmaker fails, like we have a dust bowl orders of magnitude greater than the last one, um, which I angst about sometimes. Um, that would be very bad. Um, like it's a great, it's a great talking point, right? But like actually, uh, there will be. I don't know if like unprecedented amounts of hardship, uh, maybe unprecedented amounts of hardship from lack of water, if if like that future comes to be. Uh, so I'd say that that's a black pill, and I, I do not see a lot of people working to fix that. Um, so yeah, th those are the two like black pills. Yeah. I would say. Yeah, I mean, on, real quick on the capability side, I mean, that's just makes sense. It's a natural consequence of a hundred plus years of prosperity and and mm. a, a lot of great things that have been built. Um, there's the famous Cotton Mather quote: "Faithfulness begot prosperity, and the daughter devoured the mother." That's mm. like. It's just an, it's like it's not a unique thing. Like it's it's what you would expect to have happen based on a, a prosperous time. Yeah. But the white pill. Uh, what's better than uh, most people realize? Yeah. Um, so the, so there's like the the abstract Christian one, which is like we win in the end. Um, so like actually, you know, do your darndest to to live a faithful life, but like. Doesn't matter, we're set, God's got it. Um, that I take great solace in. Uh, but but beyond that, um, like, you, you can do so much more. Like, I have had old boomers from like steel mill towns offer me responsibility to like administer a steel plant roll up in western pennsylvania I, I, who am i to do something like that like obviously I, I ultimately chose not to do that um but like there is it's the reva tez thing it's the reva tez thing like there's so much more opportunity than you can even imagine like your wildest dreams of what is possible are far far below the actual threshold of what you're capable of like you meet one person that can then open up a wild network of some of the most um, capable affluent intelligent people you could imagine um, and then and then if you're like free enough and agentic enough to take those opportunities um, like you can have such a radical impact right and like the pe people people say stuff all the time like um you know, like, like, well, Elon's Elon, right? Like, Elon's a crazy guy, right? And it's like, yeah. So try to emulate that, of course, right? Like Napoleon, oh, once in a once in a million, once in a few generations type. Like, no, emulate Napoleon, emulate Elon, like, emulate Christ. Like, actually, we can, we have the capacity in us to have this radically outsized impact on the world. Um, more than I imagined, right? Like I said, I, I did not think about entrepreneurship at all in high school, in most of college, um, and through like a series of serendipitous circumstances, like I have ended up in the 
best possible position that in my present state I could conceive of. Um, and, and so making good on that preposterous amount of opportunity that exists out there. Like I was talk, I, you, I told you guys who I was talking to earlier, like that was crazy. Like you can just talk to sovereign nations people sometimes like, yes, the answer is yes. Um, so, uh, I would say, th I would say that the, the, the big white pills are, um, like God wins in the end and, uh, you have infinitely more opportunity than you realize. Amazing, dude, cool. love it. Amen, and co-signed. Good stuff, <laughs> good Thanks. stuff, dude. Thanks for coming on. No, thanks guys. Yeah, yeah, good to see you.